It's always a pleasure when we here at Robin Hood Radio get to speak to Ralph Nader, uh, of course, our neighbor up in Winstead. Uh, Ralph has the Tort Museum. Uh, of course, you probably know Ralph from a lot of other things other than the Tort Museum. Uh, one of the most well-known political activists in this country, if not the world. He's an author, uh, a former presidential candidate, uh, and uh, of course, uh, he loves his hometown. And in his own hometown, uh, he started a tort museum. Ralph, uh, nice to speak to you today. Likewise. Thank you, Marshall. So now uh, the tort museum is open again as of today, I understand. Uh, yes. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, between 1 and 5 p.m. in the afternoon, it's open. You know, like a lot of museums that close during the winter, and of course with the COVID, there's another reason to close during the winter. Uh, but we're open, and it's a great educational experience for the family. I mean, every, everybody should know what the law of wrongful injury is. I mean, because anybody can be in a car crash or take a bad pharmaceutical or in, ingest a toxic pollution or end up in a hospital that isn't properly cared, cared for. Uh, and it's surprising how many people come to the museum and they say, what's, what's tort? Well, it's the French word for a, a wrongful injury. And uh, once again, the Tort Museum is open uh, today uh, and tomorrow uh, and uh, the third from one to five. And then after that, it's open like its normal schedule used to be on Sundays. Now, I understand uh, from your email that uh, and this is the bad thing about social media. Uh, there was a social media rumor that uh, uh, the museum was uh, was closing. But uh, uh, you have come forward to, to debunk that once again. Yeah, it was based on uh, the COVID context, you know, that people shouldn't congregate in public places. And I don't know how the rumor got started, but when people go to this museum, it's the only law museum of any kind in the world. I, I found that out when it opened in 2015. Uh, it's quite remarkable, quite a commentary on my legal profession. There are 20, 20 uh, medical uh, museums. There's 33 timber and lumber museums, but one law museum. And the exhibits are designed uh, very brightly. Uh, I think the Lakeville Journal write-up said it was like a comic book pictures of the cases. Uh, tobacco, the t great tobacco litigation, the asbestos litigation with Corvair, the Pinto, and a workplace uh, machinery that's defective. And it shows the whole history over 200 years. Is when you go into the museum, there's a wall that shows the history from medieval England when they decided it was better to uh, go to court and have a trial by jury than uh, encourage revenge attacks if somebody's harmed. And uh, uh, so it's a very vibrant. Uh, we had someone who uh, walked out, out of the museum after spending an hour, and he said, you know, I'm a museum uh, fanatic. I've been to over 100 museums. He said, this is the first museum that respects my intelligence. And it's because it asks people uh, questions about the case. It just says, well, what if involved going 200 miles an hour instead of 100 miles an hour or whatever? Uh, and they're just wonderful, bright cases and exhibits. There's even a, an enclave for dangerous toys. People uh, have witnessed toys, a lot of them imports, unfortunately, from Asia that were chemistry sets that burned kids or loose pebbles that little kids would swallow. Uh, so there is an enclave. So it's for the whole family. It's for adults and children. It's one way to, to watch a child uh, forget about short attention spans. They're really quite, <laughs> quite fascinated when they walk past all the exhibits. We well, think once people learn about tort law, they understand that tort law at its basic principle really opens up a lot of opportunities for the common public uh, that they just are normally locked out of. Yeah, of course. I mean, every year, millions of people in our country are wrongfully injured uh, from bullying to workplace uh, disasters to airplanes like the Boeing uh, to opiates, uh, reckless uh, uh, 
dumping of contaminants that get into the food or into the water, lead into the water. These are wrongful injuries. Of course, highway crashes, uh, drunk drivers, uh, defective cars not recalled. Uh, and so that's why people really find it a wonderful experience because it relates to their daily lives and what they read about and what they experience. And most museums don't do that. They don't relate to people's daily lives. They're an interesting uh, experience, but they're not that relatable. And um, there's a gift store. People can come away with T-shirts and uh, and hats and buttons and wonderful posters for the uh, uh, great artwork. I mean, the artwork is really spectacular. Uh, and uh, the posters are beautifully done in color. And then, of course, it has more books on uh, famous tort cases and tort law than probably any bookstore in America, small as it is. It's right on Main Street, and there's plenty of free parking. Don't worry about it. Plenty of free parking. It's uh, at 654 Main Street, just across from the uh, road that goes up to Highland Lake. We're speaking with Ralph Nader once again about it, the tort museum uh, that uh, the American Museum of Tort Law reopening uh, today, uh, tomorrow and the day after that. And then it'll be open on Sundays after that. And when you speak about tort law, uh, the interesting thing to me about tort law is, um, yes, there's the law where um, compensation is given to the person who was wronged. Um, but the most important thing on top of that to me is that the disclosure of the information that goes public. Uh, so the, the, the public, not only the regulators and legislators know about that particular problem. Precisely. You hit the nail on the head, Marshall. The three purposes of tort law when it's invoked, when someone is injured, goes to a contingent fee lawyer, they file a suit. It's, if it isn't settled, they go to court and the trial by jury. It's open to the press and the public. Nothing secret about it in America. Um, it has three purposes. One is to compensate uh, the injury by the perpetrator of the harm. It could be a corporation. It could be a bully. It could be uh, you know, any number of things. Um, the second is disclosure. And often the first disclosure of, say, millions of defective tires or an ingredient that got into uh, a, a pharmaceutical that was harmful comes from a, a, a single court case. It doesn't come from the regulators. It doesn't come from the legislators. They hear about it, and from time to time, they will establish mandatory safety standards, um, like in the tire safety area. Um, and the third purpose of tort law is deterrence, like if you nail one company for doing a bad thing that a lot of other companies are doing, well, the other companies start getting a message to clean up their act. The problem is that so few people know about the law of torts. We're trying to get high school students to learn about it. We have a high school curriculum in working with social studies teachers. So few people know about it that about 95% of wrongful injuries never see a lawyer. They never see uh, a legal complaint. And uh, we want to expand the idea that you have these rights, they're the best in the world, and uh, you don't have to pay a lawyer by the hour. It's contingent on whether the lawyer gets anything for you, and they take a percentage. Uh, but that's the, uh, that's the safety net. That's the justice net for people. You know, when uh, police are caught using illegal violence and they've uh, kill people, as we've seen in news reports all over the country in the last two, three years. And the prosecutors don't uh, bring the case against the uh, wayward police. Well, you know what happens is that the family, the next of kin, can sue uh, the, the city uh, under the law of torts. And that's what happened when a young boy, 12 years old in Cleveland, was killed. Um, by a quick trigger uh, police. I, the prosecutors didn't bring the case. The family brought the case. And they settled for several million dollars. Not that it replaces their child, but it generates deterrence uh, to make sure the police are trained properly and managed properly. 
So a lot of crimes, corporate crimes, are also torts. Well, I was going to say the the uh, to me the, the 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 corporate crimes are 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 the ones where the tort law yes it gives it gives some financial r resource and relief uh, to the people that are aggrieved, but it also forces that company or that corporation and other corporations uh, to to be more on their toes and to be more open so they don't wind up uh, paying out these millions of dollars. Yes, yeah, so a good example of that in the 1980s, uh, there were lawsuits against reckless in, in operating rooms. I mean, they would even expose themselves to the anesthesia. And uh, so there were some successful suits against hospitals. And the message spread throughout hospitals, and anesthesiology now is much safer uh, for patients as a result of that. There's another case uh, that people would be interested in. We also have a computer collection of cases. You can push some buttons, the case will come up. There is an apartment building in Washington, D.C., and a, a young woman uh, was a tenant, and she uh, came back to her apartment, and she was followed by somebody who uh, got into the building and molested her. She sued, and the judge said that the apartment building owner did not take security precautions, careless about not locking doors, etc. And that sent a message to apartment owners all over the country that they can be sued if they don't secure their premises. So there's your point on deterrence. Well, we're talking about the American Museum of Tort Law, located in Winstead, uh, Connecticut, and uh, it's located on Main Street, as a matter of fact, in Winstead, Connecticut. Uh, by the way, you can find out more on the web at tortmuseum.org. That's tortmuseum.org. Uh, now, um, do you still offer uh, virtual tours at the museum as well? Yes. In fact, we just got a message from Singapore. Somebody saw it virtually took the tour and said, why don't we have a tour museum in Singapore? <laughs> I said, be my guest. We need tour museums all over the world because people get wrongfully injured all over the world. Now, there are barriers. For example, there were veterans that were uh, seriously hurt in, in, uh, with these burn pits and they would in Iraq and elsewhere, and, and they would... Uh, there's a contractor that did these burn pits, a big contractor from Texas, I think. And they just dumped everything and they put uh, aviation fuel on it. And it's huge uh, pollution, toxic. They didn't uh, protect the uh, the soldiers over there. And so when they sued the, the, the company, the company said, oh, no, we're a contractor with the Department of Defense. So we share the sovereign immunity. You can't sue us. So there are a lot of barriers, a lot of insurance companies going to state legislatures over the recent decades, as we all know, to, to push what they call tort reform, what I call it tort deform, to make it harder for wrongfully injured people to achieve justice, putting caps on pain and suffering in California, lifetime of pain and suffering cap of 250,000. Um, that's been on the books for over 35 years. And that goes after the most serious patient rights, the people who are lost the wrong organ, for example, in surgery uh, or brain damage. And so we have to be very alert, uh, alert. And the more people use it, the more the justice they get, the more they're going to support it against the attacks by the corporations who don't want to be held accountable at all. In fact, uh, Johnson Johnson just did something that was on public radio. Marshall, you probably heard it. Uh, they created a, a, a subsidiary, and they took 33,000 cases from women who claimed they came down with cancer because of talc powder produced by uh, Johnson Johnson. So they put the cases in this subsidiary and then went bankrupt uh, so that uh, the people could not have their day in court. They'd have to settle for uh, a small sum if, at best. Well, you see, that's what these corporations can do. They can ex ex escape justice. No human being can escape justice like that. They can't create an, a subsidiary and get out of it. Um, and uh, and people think that's what more and more corporations are going to do unless the bankruptcy laws are reformed. And Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, and, and Senator Durbin are, 
are pushing legislation to make sure that these corporations have to be held accountable. Well, once again, folks, uh, the American Museum of Tort Law opening today, tomorrow, and the day after that, and then it'll be open every Sunday after that. Uh, and uh, once again, the web address for more information is tortmuseum.org. Ralph, it's always terrific uh, to speak to you. Uh, the, what you've uh, done for your, your hometown in Winstead and what you've done for the American public through, uh, I, I can't count the years of, of tireless uh, advocacy for for the public is amazing. And uh, we just hope you can keep up the good work and, and spreading the word. Well, you know, people can get uh, my column, weekly column, just go to nader.org, sign up, you'll get it automatically. We have a podcast called the Ralph Nader Radio Hour every week. All kinds of wonderful interviews and people who get things done for a better country and world and people who write books that aren't reviewed in the New York Times. And we give these authors a, a wide uh, uh, berth to talk about what what they've uncovered. And, and we get questions from the audience. It's on uh, Bridgeport Community Radio. So any, anybody can listen to that Sunday at 6 p.m. And then finally... There's a 12-minute video in the Tort Museum, so you could sort of get a one-hour course in tort law. Not, you know, I'm not saying you can pass a, a, a tort law test in, in, in law school, but you certainly will uh, find out the basic principles of justice. You don't need to be a lawyer in order to understand them. Well, once again, Ralph, thank you for spending a few minutes with us today. Thank you very much, Marshall. Good luck.